welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. After the devastating earthquake, relief and rescue on in Syria and Turkey. But is the devil of discrimination in the detail? In Ohio, United States, toxic after effects of a train that derailed 10 days ago and the government steps in to repress reports of toxic discharge. A massive health workers protest against the conservative regional government in Madrid Estimates say over a million people angry over the neglect of public health hit the streets on Sunday. Is the world ignoring Syria's urgent need for relief after the devastating 6 February earthquake? The quake affected Turkey and Syria, but Syria is struggling to access any aid that's available. As developing countries come forward to help the country, is the West just looking on? Abdul from People's Dispatch has been reviewing the situation. Abdul, thanks for joining us. Abdul, so it's been about 10 days since the earthquake now and we are hearing a variety of reports especially from Syria from the affected areas about a sort of shall we call it discrimination in terms of how the aid is flowing in can you just give us a sort of lay of the land what is happening well uh, it looks like discrimination very clear discrimination if you say uh, if you look at it uh, you uh, see uh, the US after a lot of pressure from the uh, 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 human rights groups, from the countries across the world, from the UN, uh, finally announced a, a temporary sanction relief last week. Right. Uh, but if you see, uh, no other country except Italy has come forward, Western countries uh, ha have come, has come forward to provide any kind of aid and relief to Syria yet. If you see, uh, uh, Turkey, there are, uh, the number of countries including the US are active on the ground, they are providing all kinds of relief possible. But when it comes to Syria, as I said before, except Italy, no other country has come up, Western countries. Though there are third world countries, there are developing countries uh, such as Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, they have come forward and provided, uh, are providing relief on the ground in Syria. But when it comes to Western countries, uh, no, no one has come forward. Uh, if you see, uh, UN has to kind of issue uh, repeated appeals uh, asking more donation, more relief work for Syria. So it is, it is quite visible that there is a, a, a discrimination going on. Also, uh, if you see uh, the within Syria, there there is much more eagerness uh, to kind of. Uh, uh, from the uh, Western countries to provide aid to certain organizations affiliate they think are uh, affiliated to their cause, uh, are, are quote unquote fighting against the uh, Bashar al-Assad government uh, uh, in in uh, Idlib and in some parts of Aleppo. So, but even uh, that aid is not reaching, has not been reaching uh, to right. these uh, uh, reasons. So. Uh, the, though the number of uh, people, uh, number of casualties, the number of uh, uh, area, uh, the amount of area affected by earthquake in Syria is relatively lesser. Uh, but uh, given the fact that Syria has been under the war for more than a decade now, and and uh, and the government has been under sanctions uh, imposed by U.S. and other Western countries, uh, of course Syria needs much more attention. Right. But that attention is not coming. And this has been uh, 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 repeated by the UN. This has been repeated by uh, the international organizations and uh, other uh, human rights uh, groups as well. Uh, Abdul, what explains the situation? How do we explain this discrepancy in how the aid is flowing? Well, uh, it is quite clear that this is, uh, this is the repercussion of the, the larger global politics in which the US and its allies have seen Bashar al-Assad as someone who is uh, 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 basically who does not fit into their scheme of things in the reason for the reason and for the larger global politics so that explains it uh, uh, and uh, they are not uh, ready to let it go even uh, at the time of the crisis um, despite their so-called commitments towards human rights right. and humanitarian uh, work and so on and so forth uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, there is one positive development. Uh, the, uh, as we know, that there has been a kind of uh, uh, disagreement over the uh, ways and means through which the aid can flow to Syria between the UN and Syria. Uh, uh, we had discussed earlier 
in this show, if I remember it correctly, about how the cross-border border aid was an issue of contention. Right. Uh, uh, thankfully, Bashar al-Assad government has agreed to the UN demand of opening much more uh, border crossings uh, into the rebel-held rebel -held areas of Syria so that the aid can flow much more easier, easily to uh, the, uh, the regions, as I said before, Idlib and Aleppo, which is controlled by the anti-Bashar al-Assad forces. That may provide some kind, uh, uh, some kind of relief. But at the same time, uh, as the regional uh, uh, left groups and the human rights groups have come forward with a joint statement uh, demanding the complete lifting of sanctions on right. Syria, uh, as China has also uh, reiterated uh, yesterday that all the sanctions need to be lifted because sanctions are the polit uh, politics, uh, is the politics which basically blocking all kinds of aid to Syria. It is hampering the Syria's health uh, uh, sector in particular, uh, which is very crucial at this time from uh, accessing medicine, uh, required medicine, re accessing required equipment, medical equipment to deal with the uh, the uh, the kind of the uh, casualties, the kind of uh, uh, health crisis which has been uh, created due to the earthquake. But uh, uh, U.S. has not, uh, do, despite the fact that, you, as I said before, that there is a temporary relief, the temporary relief does not provide enough confidence uh, uh, in the uh, 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 among the countries in the West to basically start delivering medic med required medicines and medical equipment to Syria, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, start pumping more and more resources into Syria, which would, would strengthen the health sector there and strengthen the government machinery to provide much faster and better relief work in the uh, earthquake affected regions. Uh, and that one thing uh, need to be highlighted again and again, that there is an urgent need uh, uh, that all the sanctions imposed on Syria are lifted so that all the uh, countries and all the uh, groups across the globe who are willing to provide relief can easily do that. All right, Abdul. Thanks a lot for joining us. First, a fire raged for days. Now, toxic fumes are said to be spreading in a neighborhood in Ohio in the United States. Over 50 cars of a Norfolk Southern train derailed on 3rd February and chemicals in at least 10 may carry long-term health risks. Has a controlled release of the chemicals gone terribly wrong? What is the deeper reason behind the series of events? Natalia from People's Dispatch joins us with an update on the government and company's response. So, it's been 10 days. Is it that the local authorities went wrong in how they were handling the containers that had these toxic chemicals. Can you just tell us what the latest is? Yeah, so, you know, this accident um, happened on the 3rd of February where 50 train cars out of 100 derailed in the town of East Palestine, Ohio. Several of those train cars were carrying toxic fumes. Um, and the company, um, Norfolk Southern Railroad, did a controlled release of the fumes um, a few days after the accident. Um, but the effects of those fumes on the local population are still pretty unknown. Um, and some troubling reports are coming in. So um, locals are reporting that um, animals are dying, pets, um, you know, uh, a new site obtained video of fish um, dead in the river, um, the Ohio River. Um, and so people, you know, it's, it's not um, totally clear what the effects will be on the population, but public health experts are saying that there could be some sort of um, cancer possibly decades down the line. I mean, again, like these fumes are, uh, are things that can have effects for, for years and years and years down the line in the future. Um, so it's not completely clear, but um, there is a lot of outrage because of um, the way that the accident happened, um, the reports that are coming in, the fact that the um, Ohio authorities are denying any reports of um, animals dying. Um, you know, the, the, you know, unionized rail workers are saying that even the, the reason that the accident happened in the first place was because of cost-cutting measures that have been implemented across railroads in the country. Again, 
um, you know, rail workers um, did attempt to strike last year over these sorts of conditions, over um, overworking, lack of um, lack of sick days, um, you know, trying to make few workers do um, the work of many. Um, and, you know, very infamously, the government completely shut down that strike, um, rapidly passed legislation to make um, make it illegal to strike. Um, and, you know, workers are saying that if um, what they had been fighting for had been implemented in the first place, this, this sort of accident wouldn't have even happened. Uh, Natalia, I remember discussing the railroad workers' uh, protest last year, and we also talked about the legislations the government was bringing in. What were the laws? Can you just sort of tell us how they crushed the protest? And also the railroad itself, what's its history? What, what have they been up to? Yes, so, um, you know, again, as I was saying very infamously last year, um, Biden and, and Congress, completely shut down the rail workers' strike. They took away their legal right to strike. Um, essentially, um, they could not strike on penalty of arrest um, because of just the sheer power of the railroad workers. Um, you know, the government had been sort of fear-mongering about the strike for a long time because rail workers are so essential to the economy. If they stop working, the entire U.S. economy could have shut down um, which, you know, there was a lot of fear mongering about. But again, it also could have been easily avoided by simply, you know, acquiescing to the workers' demands of getting sick pay. Um, and they were uh, like eventually forced to work without sick pay by the government. Um, and none of their concerns about, um, you know, overworking layoffs um, were addressed, which again could have prevented this sort of accident. Um, but just about the railroad itself, you know, railroad um, companies make huge, huge profits, right? So this company alone um, made a record of $12 billion um, in revenue last year um, and also announced a um, $10 million stock buyback program. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, like many railroad companies, they are always complaining that any sort of safety measure will cost them just like an exorbitant amount of money. Um, so, you know, um, this company delivered six million to Republican Party campaigns during the 2016 election cycle. This, of course, is when Donald Trump won the presidency. Um, and when Trump was in office, um, lobbyists for Norfolk, Norfolk Southern successfully shut down um, a measure that would require um, train cars carrying hazardous materials, hazardous, hazardous flammable materials um, to be equipped with um, electronic brakes, which are um, more effective than conventional brakes. Again, very related to the accident that happened where these train cars were carrying flammable materials. Um, obviously, the, the train cars burst into flames once they derailed um, and all of these toxic fumes as well. Um, and they they complained at the time in 2016 that this rule would impose tremendous costs. Um, again, this is a company that makes billions in profits every year. Um, they can definitely afford um, better safety measures um, to prevent these sort of accidents. Um, and yet, you know, they successfully shut down this regulation. And so, um, again, there's so many different ways that this could have been prevented. Um, and it's so linked to, you know, corporate profits, to, um, you know, workers' struggle. Um, yeah, it's, it's very, very much linked um, and, again, very preventable. Right. Uh, Natalia, now, what are the people in the neighborhood in Ohio planning to do in East Palestine? Is they going to, is, are they considering court action? What, what kind of measures are people talking about? Yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm sure, you know, um, there might be some lawsuits coming up, especially if people do get sick um, with cancer or other diseases. Um, they can try to trace it back to the toxic fumes. But, um, you know, it's there's a certain amount of repression people are suspecting on the ground because, you um, the Ohio authorities are denying um, receiving any reports of dying animals, even though there are several public-facing reports of 
animals dying um, in East Palestine. Um, and also um, more recently, um, the police in Ohio arrested a reporter um, for allegedly speaking while the governor was speaking um, during a, a media conference, although this was very much not the case. I mean, he 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 stopped speaking immediately when the governor started speaking, but he was tackled to the ground um, and arrested um, in front of um, media. And obviously this caused outrage. He was released the same day, but still um, people are suspecting that something is going on. Um, if journalists are getting arrested, obviously that's not a good look. Um, but as of now, um, I'm not sure entirely if there are... Um, you know, any protests or lawsuits, but I'm sure that um, that's very possible in the future. Right. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, Natalia. No problem. Organizers of a massive protest by health workers say more than a million people showed up in Madrid on Sunday. As anger rises against the neglect of the public health system, workers are demanding that the government fixes the poor staffing situation. They say government health care must be strengthened, but that their local government has been dismantling it instead. Anna from People's Health Movement joins us over Zoom to tell us how workers and the public see the situation. Anna, thanks very much for joining us. So, uh, you know, the Madrid uh, health worker strike is something we've spoken about before on the show. But the sheer scale of uh, the number of people who are out on the streets seems to be tremendous. Can you talk about why it became so big? Uh, yes, so, uh, you know, uh, last Sunday, so it was February 12th, uh, we saw again a massive strike, not only of health workers, but also by people supporting the health workers and uh, wanting to see a better uh, and uh, more holistic and uh, um, a wider uh, health, health system in Madrid. And so uh, the last one was just uh, the latest one in a series of protests and of other actions that took place since November. Uh, so um, I think we dis discussed here before also that uh, around the 13th of November, the people of Madrid took to the streets and protested against uh, the very harmful health policies that are being implemented by the People's Party government there. Uh, among their grievances are long waiting lists and long waiting, waiting times uh, for actually getting to see uh, primary healthcare physicians, including pediatricians. So that's one, one of their concerns. Uh, but also some, uh, some changes which are being made to the emergency departments, uh, the emergency, the health emergency systems, uh, and also overall to, uh, because of the commercialization of healthcare that has been promoted uh, in the Madrid area for decades now. And so uh, this, this, uh, uh, th this latest protest we, which we have seen uh, has shown that the interest uh, and the feelings about the people for the topic have not diminished over time, as probably the government had, uh, would have hoped, uh, but that people are still quite interested uh, and still ready to, to fight for, uh, for a universal public health care system. Uh, how has the government actually responded to this uh, growing swell of uh, opposition? I, I was reading that, you know, the main issue people are saying is that they want public health care and not private health care. And uh, can you talk about that? Uh, well, yes. So essentially, um, I think it's uh, it's interesting to compare how the government has uh, responded also to the health workers' demands, uh, which you know the um, doctors in the primary healthcare system in Madrid uh, have been on strike uh, on and off from November also. So that's you know uh, I think that if we uh, look at the whole time they spent on on strike together, it's about nine weeks, which is an extremely long time. For something, uh, for something as essential as primary healthcare, uh, and the government in that in that regard has been uh, stalling and has been avoiding having any significant uh, conversation with the workers. So we have seen, you know, um, uh, last time that the health workers actually took to the streets and protested was about a month ago, so in mid January, and by then the government did not want to. Uh, to actually pick it, pick up on any of the points that they advanced and put forward uh, for the health workers. So what we are seeing is that uh, you know the standard response, I would say, by 
uh, by conservative governments that they're not actually taking the pressure seriously enough and they're, that uh, they're trying to find a way in any case to avoid the topic and maybe, you know, to postpone as, uh, as, uh, as far as they can uh, and then see if it blows down a bit. Okay. Uh, but yeah, but what we are seeing here is that essentially instead of uh, winding down, uh, the protests have spread to other parts of Spain as well. So, you know, we have seen uh, protests uh, for better uh, better abortion care uh, in Castilla y León, uh, but also strikes and protests in Catalonia and in, in, in other places, in other regions of Spain. So that's um, indicative of the feeling that, uh, that people and health workers in, in Spain share at the moment. Right, Anna, and thanks a lot for joining us with that update. And that's all we have for you today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow. You can find more such stories on our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and our regular updates are available on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.